Hello, I'm Brittany Kesselman. I'm a research associate at SWAP, the Society, Work, and Politics Institute at Wits University. And I'm also a co-founder of the Food Justice Collective, We Will All Eat. This is one of a series of conversations on COVID-19, the rights of food, and radical politics. And I'm very happy today to be speaking to David Otieno. David is a land and environment scientist, an economist, and social science researcher, as well as the policy chief of the Kenyan Peasants League, which is a member of La Via Campesina, the global peasant movement. Welcome, David. Th thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's our pleasure. Could you begin by telling us just a little bit of background information about the Kenyan Peasants League as well as your role in it? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Kenyan Peasants League is a, a social movement of uh, small scale farmers, rural workers, fishers, and pastoralists. Uh, and our main aim is to basically promote peasant agroecology, uh, food sovereignty, and climate justice by basically amplifying the voices of the small scale farmers in the rural areas and also farmers in the urban informal settlements so that uh, they can be, they can, their issues can be heard, streamlined in policies. And most importantly, uh, our main goal is to organize uh, the, 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 the peasant farmers for resistance, uh, to resist uh, globalization, uh, industrial food systems, and things like that. Yeah, and uh, currently we are based in uh, three counties in Kenya, just like the provinces in Migori County, in Nairobi, and in Machakos County, in Kenya. Um, it's interesting that you have members in both rural and urban areas. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of context uh, your membership has been in before COVID-19? How was the situation for small-scale farmers? The, the small-scale farmers in urban informal settlements and also in the rural areas, you know, you know, like uh, you find that uh, most government policies uh, here towards are uh, are actually, uh, I mean, focused mostly on large-scale farmers. Uh, those ones producing cash crop for export. And in most cases, we find that the small-scale farmers uh, are, are mostly ignored or are mostly not taken into consideration when government is generating policies. So you find that and that's, that's the reason why even we formed the APL, so that the farmers can come together and, uh, and push for their rights. So before COVID-19, the situation was like that uh, uh, most small-scale farmers or, or, or the small-scale farmers are not it's very little investment from government, and uh, right now, as we're talking about, uh, as we're talking now, uh, you find that there is a food crop regulations 2020 that is being developed by the government of Kenya. We also have the, the East African Sea Supply Plant Varieties Bill, and if you look at it, some of those laws, you realize that they are actually uh, skewed towards uh, benefiting large-scale farmers, and some of the issues that are being are being. Uh, if you look at those. Those, those, those legislation I've told you, you find that uh, they're talking about banning the use of animal manure, for example. They are banning farmers selling crops in their farms. You know, like, for example, if you go to the rural setup or in the formal settlements, you find that uh, I walk into a farm uh, with uh, one dollar or hundred shillings and I buy vegetables. And you find that government is, is banning that. So those are some of the issues that you find there. And also, they're talking about... Um, I mean, uh, regulating movement of, of food from one point to another. They are saying that all farm produce must be sold in markets. So you, we realize that that is a way of trying to uh, earn taxes uh, or to tax the farmers. Uh, and you know, in food sovereignty, uh, the farmer has the right to decide where to sell the, the, the produce, who to sell to. And uh, they are also talking about uh, crop inspectors. Uh, they're talking about uh, uh, the government ensuring that uh, the storage is well. So, you know, if, if they talk about crop inspectors, uh, then it means that many farmers should be arrested. If you look at the, like the East, East Africa Seeds and Practice Variety Bill, that is before the East African Institute Assembly, it's part of the regional harmonization laws. And you find that, again, it is based on you. Of 91. And if you know you of 91, then you realize that it is actually uh, geared towards talking about protection of varieties without involve, involving the farmers, uh, patents, you know, things like that. So you find that farmers might lose their rights to grow for ages. 
And now come to COVID-19 uh, situation, you find that it has really hit farmers very, very hard. Because you find that, as I told you, we have got rural-based uh, farmers and also consumers, because we're also mobilizing consumers in urban areas and linking them to, to farmers so that they can have the target market. So the movement has really curtailed by, by the lockdown. For example, you find that in, in Nairobi, there's, currently there's a lockdown in close to six counties, Nairobi being one of the counties that has, has a lockdown. Most families in the, in the cities rely on food supplies from rural areas. And when there's no movement, or when only a few uh, companies are registered to put food, then again, that, that aspect affects uh, the farmers and the consumers uh, very much. And that's why as, as, as KPN, we came up with this scheme of, of uh, trying to see how can we be able to move food from uh, rural areas to urban area, areas to uh, respond to our members uh, who have lost jobs uh, because of COVID-19 restrictions. Some vulnerable families in the informal settlements who are, uh, I mean, uh, some people are living in medical conditions, we know them. So that's why we came up with that. But still, there, there have been a lot of challenges in terms of movement because we find that food might take close to a week to arrive in Nairobi. So if you are for example, then it, it becomes when they arrive, they arrive, uh, maybe some of them are already uh, destroyed or spoiled. So there's also pilferage because. Uh, you find that uh, it's not like the usual way. So you find that sometimes you are expecting 40 kilograms of grains, they arrive at 35 or even 30, and there's nobody who can hold your account. So those are some of the issues that we are facing, uh, I mean, right now during COVID-19. Again, government recently got some facility from, I think, World Bank uh, to be able to buy food. Uh, and the government said that they're going to, they are going to buy maize from local farmers. Again, that, you know, so if you cannot buy uh, maize from local farmers, uh, you are buying like importing maize. Then it means that the farmers are going to are not going to get the income that they need. So uh, that's why we we are talking about now creating this alternative market whereby we link the farmers and the consumers directly so they can be able to sell, buy and sell among themselves. I would love to hear a little bit more about how you are organizing those alternative markets um, and how you are organizing the movement of food to people in Nairobi who need it and compare that a little bit with the kinds of efforts that government or large charities are making to to get food to people who need it. Yes, the first thing, of course, uh, the farmers are organizing clusters, uh, and the cluster has got between 20 to 50 farmers, and also the consumers also are organizing clusters. So, for example, what we do is that uh, we get the needs of, for example, uh, this group of consumers, they need this amount of maize, they need that amount of beans or spillet or whichever. And then um, uh, we, have, we have also have, we have a, a developed a food secret system that also every farmer, uh, we have the data in each cluster. Uh, for example, from Bigori County or Machakos County, uh, each cluster leaders leadership leader, uh, like us, uh, based on survey, uh, which ones, uh, what kind of maize or beans are they able to sell? And with that data, therefore, again, we we also have the demands of the consumers. So through that now, uh, there are there are some uh, accredited companies uh, that are transporting food. So though we use, we put them in those uh, trucks, and they come to the city. But again, now it takes too long because the the restrictions and movements, and the, the cost has, has also increased drastically. For example, you find that uh, before COVID, maybe to transport uh, a 40 kilogram sack of maize was uh, around uh, 1,000 shillings, that is around $10. But now, during COVID 19, it goes up to around 30 or 40 dollars. So that one has really increased drastically. And also, uh, so that's how, and again now once the, because we, the, the, the beneficiaries have been identified, so if we uh, identify maybe a particular family needs this amount of food, then once the foods are brought, they are packaged, and then now distributed to the families that actually require them. So maybe we target, uh, like this afternoon we just given some food to uh, a person who is, uh, who is uh, living with HIV AIDS. Yeah, so we target the, the, the vulnerable people, it's good food to them. And again, so, so initially we, uh, we were targeting our members, but now we have also tried to expand now to even to our members, but members of the community 
what one of the one that was a way of mobilizing the victim movement yes and we got support from uh, one month uh, uh that uh, that now actually they are not paying for the food but comparing to to what the government is doing uh, the government is uh, has raised resources and it is using the official administration structures uh, that are existing but again it is skewed because you find that uh, there's a lot of pilferage uh, by the government bureaucracies like what buffer the kenyans is that at uh, you find that logistics like tea you know like tea costing around uh, 4000 uh, dollars <laughs> you see 40000 dollars tea for one month so you find that uh, most of the funds that have been raised by the covid-19 emergency response fund most of it people are afraid that uh, have ended in people's pockets we still have families that cannot eat we still receive calls of families uh, that are saying uh, we, we we have slept hungry the government also has started what is called kazim tani which is a uh, work in the community employing young people to clean the neighborhoods uh, to distribute uh, government uh, supplies but again even the process of recruitment has not been transparent so you find that uh, many youth are still not involved and they are, they are operating in a very opaque manner yeah wow um and i wonder uh, in this moment of crisis um are you seeing options for for transformation i mean the kind of relief work that kpl is doing is it building solidarity for for the future and for for further support for small scale farmers or is it more a moment where you know the large scale industrial system is going to take more control are you seeing possibilities for change in this crisis yeah. i think the covid-19 has uh, actually taught us a lot that the localized food systems are actually are more sustainable than the globalized ones because we have seen like for example we have seen increased demand for seeds uh, indigenous seeds uh, because we find that uh, due to restrictions uh, of global movement by uh, no flights most farmers were relying on hybrid seeds have delayed to plant so we have seen uh, an increase in uh, demand for seeds we have also seen uh, people in neighborhoods people coming up uh, uh, with systems to keep themselves safe for example uh, sensitizing the communities uh, maybe to uh, clean their hands uh, wear masks in the community most of that is being done by community groups or informal groups and uh, we have also seen um, churches uh, women groups youth groups coming together raising little they have to go and feed the people in the neighborhood to get to feed so this is actually telling us that there's a lot that we can do so it has taught us that there's some power that we had that we didn't know for example we uh, the, 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 the covid that has, has helped us to actually strengthen the systems between the the urban areas and rural areas so even post covid we have a situation where by the networks that the people who receive food uh, we have their contacts and the, the farmers uh, who uh, is supplied food we have their contacts so it is it has helped us to link them and strengthen them and that's why we are even now talking about of, of, of uh, creating food cooperatives uh, and for cleaners of co- 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 I mean consumer supported agriculture where by now the, the consumers can be able to pull their resources together put them in a pool and uh, the farmers can be able to access the, the money and grow crops and uh, so we i think this this crisis has actually shown us that uh, as a community or as a movement uh, we have a lot of things to do we have seen uh, uh, people coming up like in the rural areas the areas that were not being farmed people are farming uh, people are now focusing on uh, fast growing in interesting crops vegetables you see uh, which take one or two months because again we you know that Kenya we had a locust play locust invasion which took most part of the last year and then you see the last season was there was a very poor harvest due to prolonged rains so we anticipate a very acute shortage of food in the coming months 
And that's why uh, we have been encouraging our farmers to focus on growing crops that are growing very fast, that are really boosting to be able to deal with COVID-19. Uh, most of, uh, and that one can be actually be evidenced by the fact that we are receiving a lot of demand for seeds, indigenous seeds. Yeah, like just this afternoon again, we received a call from a place called Machapos, where um, the farmers there are asking for seeds from KPL. So it means that uh, it is giving us more reasons to intensify uh, seed banking. And that's why we have, uh, we, are, we actually, Talk with agroecology fund, uh, which is based in the US, and uh, part of the support that we're negotiating with them is to be able to uh, support in strengthening the seed banks, uh, set, uh, I mean, adding more knowledge to farmers on how to uh, save seeds safely, save crops safely. Part of the project also is, is uh, aimed at uh, buying water tanks for farmer groups so that. Uh, the farmers can continue even growing uh, harvest water, seeking boreholes, for example, so that we can have special whereby even during dry seasons, the farmers can be able to continue growing crops. So what I would say is that uh, this crisis has actually exposed uh, the failure of the globalized system of food production, and it has uh, strengthened and given, uh, in fact, uh, most farmers that are even surprised that, uh, like, there are farmers who didn't use to sell seeds, but now when you tell them, can you bring us this seed? They're saying, oh, the demand is so high. So it's giving, giving them more energy to be able to grow more crops and, uh, and store more seeds. That's very encouraging to hear. I'm happy. Uh, you brought up a topic that I wanted to ask you about, um, which is that the COVID-19 crisis is coming in the middle of an already ongoing climate crisis, which in Kenya has meant drought and then floods and a plague of locusts. Uh, and all of these crises intersect. And I have heard stories of uh, COVID-19 restrictions interfering with locust control operations uh, and other problems like that. So um, how are the small scale farmers managing all of this? I mean, it does sound like with agroecology, they are a little more able to be resilient. Yeah, yeah basically you see agroecology is based on uh, on uh, using nature, yeah, it's like in situ uh, uh, conservation or in situ management of resources. So, for example, you find that uh, there are crops that can do well in dry, dry areas. There are crops that can do well in areas that have, let me say, it has actually, uh, the farmers actually faced with the double crisis in the sense that, uh, like, locust invasion. Uh, invaded most part of northeastern Kenya, areas like uh, like Meru and uh, Embu. It, it, it even uh, attacked west, part of western Kenya, and uh, most of the crops were destroyed. But again, uh, the, 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 there is still uh, anticipation of a second wave of locust invasion because uh, the, the conditions that they require for multiply are, 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 are coming back. And, and this is actually affecting. So if you go to areas like Meru, for example, you find that huge tracts of crops were destroyed. The government has been responding with um, the government has been responding with uh, spraying, shooting, uh, shooting, shooting the locusts using guns. <laughs> you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. And you see, most of those sprays, they, 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 they are they are pesticides that are actually also maybe which promotes uh, destruction of the environment, like for example. So you find that uh, the farmers there uh, have, have, have actually come up because there are communities in Kenya that feed on locusts, for example. So people are starting to talk about how can, instead of using chemicals, today, can, this, can these things be harvested? We have also seen um, like University of Nairobi uh, opening a research center at Chiromu campus where they're trying to see uh, how best can uh, these locusts uh, be managed. But again, it's, you know, they, 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 it's a big swamp. And you see, the locusts, again, is linked to climate change, as you have said. So you must find that most farmers have now been hit twice. COVID-19 has restricted movement, there's no work. They have got uh, increased droughts and, um, and, and uh, issues of uh, climate change. 
So you find that that, uh, that issue has, has, has made the farmers uh, be really suffering. But the areas, like for example, areas like uh, southwestern Kenya, which have been spared uh, of locust invasion, so the farmers there are actually. But there's a there's some warning that um, that they must also be they might also be attacked by the locusts. So it is actually really affecting us uh, a lot, and uh, we have seen. Uh, uh, Areas that did not rely on leaf food, actually, now asking for leaf food because of uh, the, the COVID-19. I mean, because of the local situation and the issues related to the climate. Just what we have talked about. But now, as KPL, uh, you know, like uh, we, we still don't have uh, that capacity to be able to contain uh, the local situation. It should eat. Unfortunately, in the areas like in Machakos County, some parts of Machakos County where we have members who are was affected, some of our members were seriously affected. But uh, Migori County largely hasn't been affected. But there's still that fear that uh, when the second wave comes, then they might be spared. Either. You mentioned some of the legislation that the government has been uh, trying to adopt, which favors the globalized industrial food system, um, and that. Those are some of the demands of KPL around, you know, farmers having rights to their seeds, uh, farmers having rights to sell food through alternative markets or at the farm. Um, are there other sort of political demands and policy demands that uh, you think people should be making right now that will help to foster uh, an alternative food system and ensure that people have access to food? Yes, yes, actually. Actually, you realize that uh, the, as, as Kenya President League, we are engaged a lot in uh, policy interventions. And uh, we participate because, like, if you look at the Kenyan budget cycle, it runs from uh, July to June. So, and each, in each and every stage, we ensure that our members take part in terms of giving out their positions, in terms of ensuring that the production receive better locations. So one, uh, we have got, like, for example, the Water Act in Kenya uh, that talks about uh, how to manage water resources, and it, it talks about creating, uh, like, water use association. So as KPL, for example, uh, we, the KPL Women Collective, in collaboration with the Covent University in the UK, uh, we have just uh, agreed to sign a memorandum for a one-year project starting July uh, 30th to, to, to August 2021. And part of the, the project is to be able to ensure that actually the water users are formed. Because it's, it's a project about natural resource management. So you find that we could have a, there can be a law, for example, that requires management of natural resources. But then you find that most of those organs are not formed. So we are actually trying to use those laws. And in areas where they are not there, mobilize our members so that they can come to those associations to be able to uh, take part in the We also have like the lands, the Community Land Act, uh, that creates, uh, uh, that talks about management of community lands. And you see a vast majority of Canada is community land. And most of the community lands have not been demarcated. Uh, so you find that they are open for grabbing. And uh, the... The, the Community Lands Act talks about community land, community land management committees, and these committees are there to be able to uh, resolve land disputes, to be able to... Uh, and in most cases, we find that those committees are not there because the government is tasked to form them, but they are not there. Uh, so we are actually talking about forming these land committees, ensuring that women are there, widows are there, uh, people, everybody. So once those committees are there, we also have the Land Act talking about uh, uh, creation of uh, county land management boards that, have, that, that should also bring farmers. So we find that these provisions are there, but the, the, big, the main problem is that farmers, uh, uh, or majority of Kenyans are not aware that they are. So we do sensitization. We have several other laws, for example, that talks about uh, the Seeds and Plant Products Act, uh, that we are also pushing for amendments. We are pushing for to amend some sections that prohibit sharing of seeds, for example. If you look at the Peace and Strategy Declaration or the United Nations Declaration on Peace and Rights that was uh, recently uh, ratified, 
he, he talks about uh, Article 19 talks about farmers' rights. Even the, the Plant Treaty uh, talks about farmers' rights, Article 9. Uh, and now you find that the legislature can assign some of these international treaties protecting the farmers' rights, but it's still passing laws that are in contravention with the treaties that they have signed. So we are highlighting some of those uh, uh, those those articles or those sections of the legislations that are anti-farmers, and we are coming up with ways of amending them through public participation. Of course, we have to engage with the committees, like for example. Um, because food production, uh, uh, some aspects of food production is in the county government. So we have county assemblies, just like county parliaments and also the national parliament. So we write petitions to the uh, to the committees of parliaments, uh, to the committees of the county assemblies, uh, to the various departments. And even right now we find that um, the government is pushing the issue of the GM cassava, uh, beauty, cotton, and they're saying that, you know, because there's coronavirus and there's going to be food shortage now, that's why we need the GM cassava to be able to grow faster. We need people to be able to adopt GMOs, you know. So they're using the coronavirus as a guise to be able to, to promote uh, GM seeds, for example. So we are also, as KPL and allied partners, taking part in trying to ensure that the farmer's voice is heard and, uh, and ensure that the no, I mean, no treaties or I mean, no sections or laws are put in place that are against the, the, the farmers' rights, for example. There are many other, there are many other like you see the crops out again, there are some aspects in it that are anti-farmers. Uh, you look at, uh, so we are looking at the laws in one, the articles that are good and are not implemented, we push for the implementations. The, artic the articles that are bad, uh, and, and you know, it's funny that the government only implements bad Bad articles and the good ones are not implemented. For example, <laughs> for example, you look at uh, Article 11 of the Kent Constitution. Uh, it talks about Article 11 of the Constitution of Kenya. It talks about. Uh, uh, it says that uh, uh, the state uh, shall recognize the role of science and indigenous technologies in development of the nation. And uh, and it, it actually obligates uh, the parliament and the government to recognize and protect the ownership of indigenous seeds and plant varieties. It is in the constitution. So indigenous seeds basically are the seeds that the people have been living with. But here again, you find that now the act basically now uh, has articles or has sections that have contravening this constitution. So those are, we highlight some of those issues and uh, it, uh, and try to advocate, for example. So it, it takes, uh, uh, like, educating the farmers or exercising the farmers on their rights as per the constitution or as per the, the documents that are there, and then asking them that, one, practice it, because if, if it's the constitution, the first step is that the farmers need to practice. Because when we have a constitution and an act, the constitution is superior. So when so those are some of the arguments and we are also considering to go to move to court on two cases. One is on the glyphosate-based herbicides, which is a new which, which is produced in Kenya. Two, we are trying to move to court if they, uh, so that some of the sections that in some of these legislations that are in contravention of the constitution, then those ones should be expanded. Yeah. That's a lot of projects that you have going on. Um, but it's nice to hear that at least there is a constitutional basis for some of your work. Um, that's that we also in South Africa have a constitutional right to food that people are not able to actually enjoy, but at least it gives us something to mobilize around. Yeah, for example, maybe just a bit, just a bit. Yeah, you find that uh, if you look at uh, Article 22 of the Constitution of Kenya, uh, and that is the article that we use mostly, it says that every person has a right to institute court proceedings claiming that a right or a fundamental freedom in the Bill of Rights has been denied. So that is uh, one of the articles that we base on. And it, it goes on to say that um, uh, every person can go. You don't need an advocate, you don't need, and, and it, is, it should not be charged. You see, some of those are, those are some of the provisions that are there in the Constitution that people are not aware of. So we are trying now to 
see how we can be able to use such provisions to be able to enforce the right of the law. Just out of interest, I was wondering if you could tell us a few of the types of indigenous seeds and indigenous foods that people are more interested in right now. Yeah, right now people are mostly interested in indigenous uh, vegetables. Uh, we also have people looking for indigenous maize. Uh, and um, and you, uh, so basically, the, 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 uh, we have people in the, in the burning cassava. And we have realized that cassava is not so much because when we are trying to get the seeds, they, they were not uh, so much uh, in, available. And we have now focused, we have, we have now started to ask uh, the farmers to start growing the cassava. We also people wanting millet, uh, sorghum. Uh, we have those ones uh, who want uh, indigenous maize, indigenous beans. We, we have what. Uh, Indigenous fruit, the wild fruits, for example, because we have got farmers in Igori County who are propagating or trying to revive the indigenous fruit. So you find that people are telling you, can we get uh, this type of fruits? Can we get this type of uh, vegetables? So we have got an array of um, indigenous uh, uh, vegetables that uh, have been grown, but people had actually been had ignored them. So it is, I mean, you find that um, to us, has actually given us a lot of impetus to keep on growing. Every we, like now every member in the every 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 member of ours, maybe we are in the urban areas, we have asked them to have small chicken gardens and grow the crops. If you can get a place by the roadside or you can get a place along the rivers, so that by growing them is a way of banking them, it's a way of propagating them, and also it's a way of ensuring nutrition uh, uh, I mean for the farmers. So like right now we have been able to distribute seeds uh, to around 10 groups that are not members of KPL. Uh, some of them are from Baringo County. We have given to around three groups. We have uh, two groups in Akuru County. We have what even in Kajiado County, we have what even within Arubi County where we have been able to distribute. And we still have a lot of demand for that. And um, that's why we think that the, the program that we are going to do with the agricultural funds from the U.S., is, is actually going to, uh, to help us in ensuring that the seeds are kept well and we increase the acreage. Part of the fund is also to increase the acreage under food. So if a farmer, for example, had one acre and, uh, and he, used, he or she used to grow in a quarter of the acre, then how can they increase it to half? So we are actually trying to increase the acreage, trying to, to have in each and every household, we have a seed bank uh, where the uh, there are conditions that are appropriate for storing this. That's great. It sounds like a very good combination of practical work on the ground uh, with the policy and advocacy work to make that groundwork possible. Exactly. exactly. Because what, what we have been telling the farmers is that uh, the fast way of breathing life, because if at 11 tells us you can store the seeds, or you, you can plant the real seed, then we, that's already the right that we have. So the, the only way we can have, have it implemented is by farmers actually planting the seeds, storing the seed. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about the situation yeah. in Kenya. And it sounds like uh, KPL is doing really excellent work during this time and in general. Is there any other comment that you would like to add? Well, uh, what, I can, what I can add is that, um, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, this, this corona crisis has, has basically uh, exposed uh, the important role that is being played uh, by the, by, by the small-scale farmers or by the peace and farmers, not only in Kenya but globally, because we are also talking to our members or our comrades from Tanzania and the comrades from Uganda, and uh, it has actually opened our eyes and um, and it has actually give, give, given us a reason to continue practicing agroecology of food sovereignty. Uh, and uh, again, also, it has uh, actually exposed the unpreparedness of the government in terms of responses, for example. You find that even uh, uh, most people who are living with medical conditions they are, and are taking medicine, even, and, and most people, uh, especially in the urban areas, 
who are living from hand to mouth and who are uh, relying on jobs and construction companies, uh, jobs maybe as household, for example, which is, which is now disrupted. So you find that uh, it is it has exposed the unpreparedness of the government, but again, it has actually made the communities to understand that we are on our own and we can be able to come up with systems, for example, to be able to respond. So we have had even uh, communities coming together to ensure because the schools have been closed and the government has said that there's going to e-learning is continuing. So we have seen communities coming together, raise resources, uh, go online, uh, print the papers, and give them to other students. We have seen um, uh, communities coming together, like even within KPL Women Collective, we, we have uh, been distributing sanitary towels from well-wishers, uh, raising resources and giving to girls during this, this period. We have also been organizing feeding programs maybe over the weekends in informal settlements, like uh, on Saturday, uh, our members will be in a slum called Kibagari in Nairobi, where they, they're going to uh, cook food for, for children who are from very vulnerable families. So it has, it has actually shown that we have been seeing ourselves as powerless, but whatever we have been doing is actually uh, what has been sustaining us. So that, what I would say is that uh, this is the time for the, the peace and movements globally tonight and, uh, and come up with systems that can be able to support what we are doing. We, can, we should actually be able to focus more on establishing good distribution systems, good authentic markets in all of these areas. So, so that even in post COVID, we are able to ensure that our farmers get markets directly uh, for their for, uh, for their products without middlemen or women who have actually been cashing with them. Yeah, that, that, that's what I would add for now. That's great. I think it is definitely an opportunity to build solidarity yes. and and see communities come together and, and find their power. So yeah, thank you very much, David, for a really interesting conversation. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much too.